Hi, welcome to today's session on navigating the Google Drive workflows for productivity and collaboration part two. Uh, my name's Jared. And I'm Adam. And we're both teachers and digital learning advisors with the Department of Education. And just to be aware that this uh, webinar is, is a pre-recorded webinar. However, we do have someone in the chat that's ready to answer your questions uh, as we go all the way through. So if you do, something comes up and you want to post in there, there is someone uh, there to support you. Uh, there'll also be some support links being posted in that space for uh, what we're running through today. Absolutely. So today's uh, session is all about navigating uh, Google Cloud workflows. But before we uh, get, in, uh, get into it, I believe we should acknowledge country yeah absolutely so we recognize the ongoing custodians of the lands and waterways where we work and live uh, we pay respect to elders past and present as ongoing teachers of knowledge songlines and stories we strive to ensure every aboriginal and torres strait islander learner in new south wales achieves their potential through education uh, on this picture here on the left hand side is a picture of lake Parramatta, uh, a place where i uh, work and live and it's on darug land so we just like to acknowledge that land uh, in this meeting today as well Excellent. Let's go full screen. Cool. So in our series, uh, all to do with files anywhere, anytime, we're taking you through a series of steps that help you uh, build your digital maturity through um, sort of a sequenced um, scope of learning to help you in your uh, new file space that is a cloud platform. In the previous session, we took you through um, what it would mean to move from emerging into a developing school. Uh, and we covered things like using sync, creating and sharing and attaching files, how to bring all your personal files all into one space and uploading media using your uh, mobile device. The next phase is developing um, our skills further prior to um, migrating of files, probably still very server reliant, However, you probably dabbled in some of these spaces and what we've covered in the last um, section, the last session, you may already be quite familiar with. So progressing on that today, we're going to look at um, students and sharing files um, with students in your class, using assignments to push work out and receive and mark with um, the work that, you, um, that your class submits. We're going to look a little bit around file security and naming conventions and a few things, a few habits that are uh, good for productivity. We're going to look at what happens when we delete files and how we can recover them if that uh, deletion is, is an accident. How can we create potential private spaces or additional spaces in our file storage? And we also just want to have a little, uh, take a bit of time to think about what are some of, to sort of analyze our current file structure. What's working, what's not, and what we can start to do in preparation for designing a new space. Yeah, so I guess this developing phase is kind of just taking the next step. Yeah. Uh, once we've got all the basics, sync clients and understand how sharing works, let's dive into a little bit of a, a deeper space and focusing, I guess, a little bit more on students uh, in this section as well. Absolutely. So I guess we'll begin by jumping straight into the student portal and uh, how students, because they're also affected by or need to work in this cloud environment now. So we, from a student's portal, they will need to navigate down to where it says the Google Workspace. There it is there. And then the next screen will look much like the teacher interface. I guess, Sharon, our previous version, uh, well, previous video, sorry, uh, we did focus a little bit on the Google for desktop app. Yeah. Um, and because we're focusing, I guess, on students for this little part, um, students can use the Google Drive for desktop. However, it just comes down to how, how many devices you have in the school and how students are using them. So it's very much a shared device state. Um, we probably wouldn't recommend using that desktop client. Uh, if you are lucky enough to be in a one-to-one -one environment, some schools uh, are in that state, which is great. And hopefully more and more schools uh, will be moving to, to be able to, to use that, which would be great. But um, yeah, very much a decision to be made based on that. If it's a shared device, we don't recommend all lots of students signing in. It can yeah, divide up that space. It really can, because um, if everyone's seeing their files over time, uh, that device is going to start running very slow because a lot of its resources are taken up seeking process. Yeah, so I guess for this demonstration, we're going to be um, assuming that it's not a one-to-one -one environment and we're going to go through the browser. Absolutely. So we recommend the web view for students and just like the teacher interface, the student interface is basically exactly the same. They will have their files that they create, they will share with you. Um, and we'll probably spend more of this opening um, period here in this session, looking at how the teachers can send files out to the students and receive them back. But no change in the interface for students, they have their My Drive. They can be uh, linked to a shared drive. A teacher has to be an owner of a shared drive for them to be a part of it. Um, 
But for the most part, they're going to operate out of their my drive space as they send work to and from you, to and from you as the teacher. Perfect. So I guess uh, encouraging students to create their content in the cloud uh, network is, is a better option. Mm -hmm. So often uh, you might be having students create brand new documents from, say, the desktop or from a particular app on the computer. But I guess we want to encourage that coming to the Google Drive online. And then uh, just above my drive here, you've got new. So this is going to be a great place to start off those new documents. If you start them from here, it means uh, they're automatically saved in the student's my drive don't need to be uh, saved or yep. you know, save as, you know, Moved. to find location, move, those kind of things. You won't end up with a duplication. It's just there ready to go. So as soon as uh, this document gets named, uh, then that name gets saved. If you don't name it, it will just be named untitled. Sometimes it does pull on the first few words of a, of a, of a document uh, and it will come up with that for you. But untitled document, it still is saving it. So you can see up that top corner, save to drive. It's, it's good to go in the little uh, box next to that little cloud. You can also click on that. Students can actually see um, that all changes are saved. The, the one next to it, you can actually see where the document is saved as well, which is pretty handy. So it's saved in my drive and you can actually move some content from there as well. But really nice way to make sure things are safe and secure. But, you know, we always um, we always talk about that end of the lesson yeah. where you've got students to kick up a whole bunch of work and you've gone a little bit over time as per usual. The bell goes and, you know, got to pack up the laptops and send them to the next class. And you're kind of calling out to make sure you save your document, those sorts of things. And inevitably there's three or four who forget or yeah. save it in the wrong place. So whereas this process, you're setting it up in the right location from the beginning of the lesson, and therefore it's ready to go. Hey, if there's any content that a student produces that is not, let me just close this for a moment, if you any, any content that they may produce that doesn't, that can't be created directly in here, so there's a, some a picture or something of that nature here, we have a, and I've got a Word doc here on the desktop, it's as simple as, Anything that can't be created directly in its location, you should save to the computer's desktop and either using the new file upload or the click and drag and drop a file straight into our web view or upload that file for us to store in our cloud storage. Perfect. So really easy way to do that. Um, I guess Jared just showed two ways, which is great. So drop and drag or new upload. You can upload a whole file as well yeah. um, or sorry, a whole folder as well as a file of content. So from a teacher's uh, point of view, we're going to now have a quick look at um, what that looks like when we want to send files out to our students. And of course, you are quite possibly familiar with this space. You would have highly likely dabbled with this during COVID, but using a Google Classroom to send files out to our students. So probably from this interface, you click here on Classroom. There is another way if you sign into the browser, we might touch on that in a moment. And we've got the classrooms that you have created to create a new one. Really, really simple. Up in the top corner, you can hit the plus and hit create class. And for your students, they could join your class using a code. So we've created a class already for today, the 6B20, uh, 6BP 2023. That's a combination of our last names. <laughs> and here is just a very, very, um, just a demo, uh, demo classroom space. If we want students to join, there's that join code right there. Okay. Students can type in and join. Otherwise, we can manually add them up here under people. We can manually add. Here we can add teachers and we can add students, just one student in this class today. So I guess really easy to have students and co-teachers as well, really handy. If you've got teachers in between classes, you've got that visibility of content, which is really handy. And I guess, uh, Jared, within Google Classroom, is it just for setting homework? Do we, just, do we just use it for that or does it have a whole lot more power to be used within a classroom setting? Oh, 100%. So probably that, I guess I'd call it a misconception. Mm -hmm. In the past, we probably did use it a lot for homework related type activities, but we feel like the using Google Classroom as a vessel to get work out to your kids during a day, during a lesson is where you should be using it now. It could be used as a way to send out uh, what we call it under classwork tab, we'll send out an assignment. Now that assignment could be uh, just a way of having students confirm with you that they've completed the task as a checklist, or is it a way for them to submit work back to you as the teacher to, um, to, to, uh, yeah, to mark and provide grades and track it through that method. So to create a new assignment, yeah, to create. Now we've got a few options here. We can reuse old, uh, old material. You can drop a question in that needs a simple answer. You can create a self-marking quiz and things like that. Uh, but we are going to create an assignment today and we're going to give that assignment. Maybe it's something, maybe we're going to send out something that does not require a, um, doesn't require anything to be sent back. We just want to send some material straight out to our students. 
So that material might be maybe it might be maybe it's a writing prompt. Um, actually, you know what? Well, let's say we're going to send him an article to read and summarize. Yeah, so maybe we'll, I don't know. Maybe we'll call it a reading task week ten. So it's good to put a date on certain tasks that's good to track. Yep. You can give them instructions if required, and then you can get an attachment from somewhere in your drive that might be useful to them. Quite often, you're going to get it straight from Drive or you're going to go and cre uh, create a brand new document, or you're going to upload it using that desktop sync from somewhere else. So practice sets in here, which we can touch on down the track as well. Lots of options there, I guess, Jared. Yeah, lots of options. So I'm going to just grab something from my drive today. And in the previous video, Adam uploaded, say, these pictures <laughs> of an article. So I am just going to grab said picture, and I'm going to add that as an attachment to my assignment. At the moment, you can see that this, um, Upload is so students can view the file. Perhaps this reading task would be to, uh, I don't know, maybe it's going to be a read and summarize the task, whatever it might happen to be. Um, and then maybe the students will complete this work in their book, but it's just, a, a, as I said, a vessel to get the work out to the students. So I won't give it a topic or a due date or anything for this. Yeah, I just, I just think, Joe, the, the value of this is, you know, you've only got one, realistically, for the most part, only one main learning display in your room. You've only got one screen that you can put content on. Yeah. So for something like a writing prompt or something you're going to read and summarise, it's really valuable to be able to push that out. You might have a couple of different uh, articles, maybe you want to differentiate that content and send yep. a couple of different things to a couple of different groups of students. I guess this enables that and makes the process a whole lot easier, less effort for the teacher trying to figure out how to show lots of different content only on one panel. It gives, it makes every student's device their own kind of location to draw on content. 100%. So for this, we're not asking for any sort of digital um, like work to be returned digitally. So you can set a due date, you can set a topic, you can set some points, it defaults to 100. Um, and things like that. But we'll go through this in greater detail later. If I simply just assign that now to the class, I've asked for nothing necessarily to be submitted, but we do ask the students to click turn in when they've completed the task. For me, that's going to work as a teacher as a little checklist so that I can I can ask the student later. I can should be able to if I get honest responses that yes, they have completed that task and that is a way to yeah, cool. checking. I guess uh Joe, maybe we'll have that task set and let's create another one where we actually modify. Uh, the maybe a document, Google Doc or a Google yep. slide or something that will create a bit of a template and we are expecting them to then return that same task um, and have a look at how we can distribute uh, documents to students with varied permissions, whether it's a view uh, or an edit access as well. So I guess a similar task, Joe is typing up a similar activity, but we're going to actually add some different content. So we might, again, we might upload that same image which yep. is perfectly fine. Well, but, you might just have that like one picture on the board, yeah. but you want each student to write about it and submit it to you digitally. I guess what would be the benefits of having a digital submission in the space? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess if they were going to uh, have a look at how we did it originally, so they went to their My Drive, started up a new doc, that just lives in their My Drive. So then every single student in my class, say 25, 30 students, yeah. have then got to share that with me somehow. <laughs> they probably do it in a variety of ways. They might send a link, they might send 30 emails, yeah. they might um, type my name in and share it with me individually. So then I would also have 30 emails, I have to capture all that content, store it somewhere. So it's a lot of process for me to get that work from the students. Whereas this process here is going to automatically distribute the same document to every single student. Yeah. And then simply by clicking return, the students click return, it comes and is organized in a folder for me to access as a teacher. So you massively yeah. streamline that process. You take that as a traditional activity where you might get them to write it in your book. And then that marking requires everyone to bring it to the front of the room with the page open, ready for you to mark. Yeah. Okay. That might be in a tote tray that goes in the video car and gets thrown around on the way home. This method will address all of that, all those pain points of just having it in a nice organized space. So for this, I want to say, I want all my students to do this in a, in a Google Doc. And it's gonna create a single Google Doc and it's gonna open uh, said Google Doc where I can, if I wanted to, I could drop the prompt straight in there and they could write underneath it and things of that nature. I could just send them this blank document if I chose. If I go back here, there's that untitled document that I've placed in, if I give it a name, which we might do that just because it's good practice to make sure that this would be um, maybe writing week 10, pop that in there, go back here. So this will update in a moment to writing week 10. Uh, and at the moment, only students can view the file. That's view the one file, but I'm gonna change that so that I want 
if I did this middle option, everyone can make a change to that single file. Same same document, everyone's editing. Yeah, everyone so that would get a little bit messy. You'd be crazy bit with 30 nuts. students jumping in and editing one document. It might You might have set it up really well, so it might be tabled and add their yeah. own sections or a Google slide deck where they might be able to have a slide each. Definitely some uses for that, but I would say for this particular task, we want each student to yeah. copy. Make a copy for each student. It just makes life so much easier. Same prompts down the side. You can give it a due date, a topic. You can differentiate whether you want it to go to just the only one student this class. But if there was more, you could choose who gets it and then you could design a different task for other people. So yeah, that everyone gets a copy is something that I think can be really well utilized. Again, let's hit go on that. That will be sent out to everyone in our class. So what we might do in a moment now that that's been signed, we will jump over to our student view and let's go to Google Classroom for students. Again, accessing through a portal straight into Google Classroom. Yeah. Mr. Pullinger is our teacher in the class today. Perfect. Uh, and you can see here, oh, I've been sent to assignments. And remember, this could be tailored to their level. Uh, that reading assignment that we sent them, it could literally be they've read it, they've done in, in their book, just like we've asked them to do. And on the right here, they could choose to add an additional something to send back. But all I'm asking you to do is say, click mark when done. And yes, I didn't attach any work. Just the teacher just wants to see that it's done. Yep. I want them to check it off and then I can uh, yeah, follow that up later. So it's basically like a student register. They're saying, I've, I've completed that task that you want me to do. You might have set a couple of things to do in a particular session yep. and they tick them off as they do them almost just using it as, a, as that register of, of work completed. And then as a teacher, you can go down and see who has submitted and who hasn't. Yeah. And then a really nice visual to be able to chase up students who may be struggling with a particular task or need a bit more support. 100%. So I jump back in here and I had a second assignment, that writing prompt that was sent to me. This time you'll see that file that we sent out that we want everyone to make a copy. So I can click on that file. It's going to open up and I'm going to do some incredible writing here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then when I'm finished, the little turn it in button actually appears in the document now, which is kind of cool. Or alternatively, I can go here and say turn it in as well, or I add an additional. So maybe I'm gonna say turn in over here. That's gonna send it back to the teacher for marking. And yep, there's one attachment, turn that in. So it just brings us back to the previous page once we do that. I guess it's just confirming that you didn't have a couple of different documents you needed to attach to that, yep. to that task, but usually, yeah, you might have, you'd have one or you could have a couple of different things as well. And you will see comments appear once the teacher does it. So let's flick back to the teacher view. Here I can click on set assignment and I can see that my one student has turned it in. Great, let's review it. I guess this interface here, Jared, is where kind of the, the value starts to get added in terms of, being able to easily jump between, you know, one student's work to another with a real quick flow rather than that kind of having to open up individual documents over and over again to view 25, 30 samples of work. Yeah. And you can just click these arrows to flick between students, provide the feedback down this side of the page, give them a grade, provide feedback. You know, 100 out of 100 for this wonderful piece of incredible Great. writing. Great bit of work there. Excellent. I can add a comment. Yep, let's post that to the student and then I can say return. And so that just sends noti notifies the student of their mark and any comments. Maybe they'll read it. I remember so many times I'll do very detailed um, you know, red pen down the bottom of the page. I uh, need to find out they never read what I wrote to them. Maybe this way they'll get an email, they'll get a ping. They will uh, hopefully read my feedback that I've given them. So a really simple, easy workflow there in Google Classroom. Use it as a way to get work out to your kids. It's really, really efficient. Um, you can see there's a view and then back in Google Classroom, we can actually fill grades, which again, we'll touch on this a little bit later when we talk assessment, but you can see the mark, this 100 out of 100, great work. Zero out of 100, we didn't give that a score. I probably should have given that a score, but over time, you can track the progression of your students' work. Absolutely, and I guess uh, to point out that there is a whole lot more to Google Classroom, we're giving you, I guess, yes. quite a brief overview or maybe an introduction. Yeah. And this is how you, if you haven't used it before or you haven't used it much, uh, or maybe you did only use it during home learning and it's kind of fallen off your radar, just, I guess, a couple of suggestions of how it could be used really in a really basic way. 
to start kind of getting the students used to um, either just registering the definition task or getting some simple content out to them or, or completing a simple task. There are a whole lot of things you saw and Jared showed how many different things you can add to a Google Classroom. There's a whole range of things you could add, build it out into uh, a really big kind of project task as well, Same. but it can be kept simple or it can, you, can, you can dig deep as well. If you've identified at this early stage of developing your cloud um, knowledge in this space, it also is it just you or is it we really want to make sure that everyone in the school is at least attempting to use this in some way as it is a nice efficient workflow. Yeah. Uh, I guess the next one on our list is to look at uh, maybe a little bit. There's a couple of those files. So last uh, session, we talked about file security and some of the sharing options. We just want to touch on two or three of those right now. Um, my drive prompt like there, beautiful. Yeah. And uh, we're also going to quickly talk a little bit about files that are shared with me. And we're going to talk about naming conventions for files to help streamline the ability to search for stuff. Perfect. So let's dive in, I guess, to when we are choosing to share. So again, uh, you can go open up the document and click on the share in the top right hand corner, which we showed before. Even without going in there, I can just click on the three dots or even right click on the file and have a look at that share option. It brings up the same, basically the same menu. Uh, it shows me who has access, uh, which is really good to note. So if you're not quite sure who has access to a document in your My Drive section, this is a way you can really easily check it. You can quickly modify some um, some permissions. You might, have, permissions you might have accidentally made someone an editor when you realize actually they probably shouldn't be. Uh, they can become a commenter or a viewer. Yeah, you can actually good. add some nice little bit of expiration, expiration date as well. So that could be really useful if you're um, wanting uh, you know, a colleague to, to modify or maybe the whole school has access for a period of time. And then when that date finishes, uh, everyone loses access and it's, and it's kind of uh, comes back to you. You can transfer ownership of a, of a uh, file as well, which is really handy or completely remove that access from someone. So some nice little features, some little granular kind of features yep. to be able to make that really user friendly. You might actually decide to share this out to, you know, the whole parent community, but only for a period of time and only with a viewer access. So you can see there's a couple of different ways that we can utilize some of these permissioning tools to, um, yeah. I guess it's out there in the world doesn't mean you can't bring it back. Yeah. You need to do any sort of significant changes. Yeah. Um, and really common, I guess, Jared, is yeah. sharing, but never remembering to unshare. I yeah. think that expiry date is kind of like it's our reminder. Yeah. You're thinking about it now, oh yeah, I'll remove that in three weeks time. In three weeks time, could have been felt like three years of school because there's so many things happening. So you just forget. And so having that expiry date is really, really handy. Yeah. So another thing we're going to look at is when we click here on viewer, there's a few, uh, there's one option here that doesn't default at the moment at the bottom there it says, is this link searchable? At the moment, we've got teach must have the link to access. And that's really important that it's a security method that unless you've been sent the link or you have the link, you can't get into that file. Uh, we do not recommend clicking the one can find in search results. You don't want someone typing something into Google and being able to find it um, and access it because the link is now out there in a, in, a, in a searchable context. So don't select that link. Yeah, we wouldn't suggest suggesting it. The, the only time you would do that is if you've created a resource and you're happy for any teacher in the state to access that resource if yeah. you're a real sharer and it's got no uh, confidential content on it, it's nothing yeah, to do with nothing your it's, it's something you've created that you're really happy to share. There's probably other platforms to share that on, yeah, yeah. but that's realistically the only time you would have that as a searchable mm -hmm. option. So we would leave that unticked as well. We quickly looked at viewer, commenter and editor before, which is really great. Uh, to have a look at. The last little bit is this little cog, a little bit kind of hidden there, Jared. It is. Uh, in terms of the settings when we're sharing. So if you do tick that, these again are, are kind of set by default. So this is settings for this particular document. So editors can change permissions and share. So if I give that editor level permission, say I took this document, shared it with Jared and gave him editor access, yeah. he can actually change some of the permissions because I've given him that editor ability, um, but I can actually untick that. And I'm like, actually, yes, you can edit my document, but no, you can't uh, share it onto anyone else. You can't yeah. it's um, just modify for you that you kind of thing. Yeah, just, just for you. It's kind of like, a, no, there's no pass it on. Yeah. Sort of, it's kind of removing that ability. And then the other one is within the viewer access, if I gave Jared view access uh, or commenter access and actually removing that ability to download, print or make a copy of. So you want them to view it, but then you actually want another layer of security to say, well, yes, you can view it, but I don't want you taking a copy and I don't want you um, to be able to uh, print it or copy it. So adding another kind of level there. So you can either have that ticked or unticked depending on what levels of permission you want to be able to have that in. For the most part, you probably won't access these, but there could be the occasional file you feel like you just need to be able to do a tiny bit more. And that's why you choose yeah. these settings. Yeah, perfect. So I guess the next thing to have a quick look at is here now, my drive we haven't touched on yet is this shared with me. These files are files that are shared directly with you. So back 
taking those share options, someone types in your email address, mm -hmm. and these files appear here. There's a couple of things that you may or may not um, do in this environment. Um, some people love living out of the shared with me and they use this to search. However, because it's usually done in some, it's chronological, you're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling to find things that might be really, really important. So what a lot of people will do for files they wanna access regularly, they might click on the three dots and they say, add shortcut to drive. Now that's gonna add a, a link to this shared file and you can place that link somewhere in an organized space. And they're usually denoted by a little white arrow, just like here on this literacy um, folder. It's got a little white arrow. So it's actually, this folder was shared with me by somebody else to this account but it actually lives in somebody else's drive, um, but it's just shared with me and I can put it in here and move it around a little bit without affecting um, the work at there. And it's just for organizational purposes. That's where you might choose that, click the three dots, add shortcut to your drive. Uh, fairly common practice, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, it can be definitely. And I guess it's definitely you thinking about when you are sharing content, we'll probably dive a little bit in a minute into shared drives where it can be a little bit of a safer space for sharing and it gives shared ownership of that content as well because the shared with me if i go into shared with me say that literacy folder the owner of that literacy folder decides delete move yeah, it's going move access I, I don't have it either so um there's no kind of you know the ability to maintain visibility over content it's very much relying on the owner the original owner the yeah. one owner i guess yes. of that content in order for me to access it as well so being cautious i guess when you're doing, doing sharing folders and sharing content to know that am i just sharing am i sharing it for a particular purpose or should it just be shared with everyone because it's a shared uh, bit of content for my school? Yeah. So the other thing we mentioned before is talking about naming conventions. How should we name files? Now, for me, I always found it frustrating. I can never ever find um, risk assessments. And they're always, unfortunately, people have the habit in their faculty drive of creating a folder in there with their name, you know, Steve A. And that's where he stored his risk assessment for last year's excursion camera. But I really want to find that, but I can't find it because he hasn't named it in a way that I can easily search for it. So it's something that a school should have a look at overall, or even when you choose to name a file, have a think about what's going to make this identifiable for someone in my school, particularly when we drop it into the shared space, into our shared drives. How can someone find it? What can we search? Avoiding creating folders in your um, faculty teacher space. You don't want a folder in here um, named after people. It just it's just a not a not a great naming um, strategy and something to avoid another thing to avoid is also and it doesn't happen especially for these migrated spaces this is more of an issue if you had a pre-existing uh, google drive that you had from middle school is try not to put a date in the naming of that now you can rename it not too bad but it doesn't make a lot of sense having a school folder called you know my school folder 2023 really only super relevant for that year at the same time, you don't want to be recreating new shared drives every year. We want to look at something called archiving, which we will touch on a few strategies in our next session on how we should archive and where we should have those opportunities in our folder structure. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess within here, you can have a think about what are your top tier level folders. So it's nice to have some really clear kind of top level folders. We do recommend archiving content yeah. um, that is not as relevant as it need, as it as it could as some of the relevant content. So I guess that idea of we don't want to go too deep with our file structure. Yeah. I, four folders deep is I guess a rule of thumb, or four yeah. or five folders deep. I know uh, in my previous uh, or in lots of schools that we've been at, you have uh, clicked open a folder, so you might go into one particular folder, and then you go into the year of that folder, and then to the term of that folder, and then in, you've gone about already 10, yeah. 11 folders deep just to get to that one document that's really relevant this term sort of thing. So thinking about archiving things that have gone past and bringing that like this term's content, this relevant yeah. content right up to the top of that tree structure. So there's just less clicking. So, you know, if we have to double click 12 times less every time we get to a document, oh, absolutely, it just adds up time. Definitely um, going to make it a more specific. efficient uh, procedure. And I guess, um, so this is just, I guess, a little bit of an example of thinking about some of those bigger headings of folders. Yeah. Um, we always like to think about it, you know, um, everything has a place, everything has a home, I guess, or every file should have a home. Normally structures get messy when someone can't find where something lives. There's not a, there's not a place for it to go. So uh, really having a think about what that might look like. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we get too much further into organization, um, something to look at is what happens if we delete something? 
Mm. We're accidentally deleting, and this happens a lot, especially from the sync. You think you're in my drive, but you're actually in shared drives, and you go and wipe out a whole bunch of content. How can we get that back? Yeah, perfect. Uh, and previously, pretty tricky, I guess, from the looking at the school server. Yeah. You accidentally deleted a whole lot of stuff. Tricky and a long time to get that back. Usually recoverable, sometimes not, depending on how much yeah. time had passed before you realized. But uh, yeah, definitely. So, as Jared said, uh, when people are learning how to use these spaces, uh, it can be a little bit tricky. So someone might go in and think they're just deleting something that I don't want this in my drive, but actually look, I'm sitting in the shared drive in the teacher space, that's everyone's space. Yeah. So if I do choose to delete some content, then it does disappear. So let's go in and we added some content to the media library. And I think, oh, I don't really need media, that's fine. I'm gonna go down and delete that. Um, so what I've done, it's actually told me that it's moved to the trash, which is nice. So, and then it says these items will be deleted after 30 days and collaborators will lose access. So that's everyone within that shared drive will lose access. You do have a nice kind of month period to kind of fix your error, which is yeah. great. But I guess, where do we go to find that that um, mistake, even though we're in the File Explorer? Uh, yeah, if it happens in the File Explorer, you want to jump back into your web view and very easy to find straight down here, you got the trash. And there's that media folder that Adam just wiped out. And it's just a matter of clicking on the three dots and saying, restore, I'd like that back, please. And it takes me on the size of the file, it's pretty quick. You can go back here to our shared drives, into teacher, and there should be one here now, uh, media's back, and we haven't lost it. That process was really fast. In the old server days, um, with the on-site server, that process might take days. So to be able to get it back instantly is a really cool way to recover your files. And the My Drive and Shared Drive things will appear in there. Um, so yeah. That's how you access it. Yeah, it applies for both personal. So if you've accidentally deleted a whole lot of your own content, it's jumping into the trash and treating that. 100%. Um, in the time period is really good. Now, some schools love, uh, it's a, some schools like the ability to create new spaces that have a bit more of a private nature. Uh, we know in Teams there's things called private channels, but in Google, what we, what some schools may do is create a new shared drive and you're only going to share it with those people that have access. So right now, even on the screen, you can see all the eight shared spaces, but if you don't have permission to say office or principal, it doesn't even appear for you. So that is a method that schools may want to spin up a new shared drive for a particular task or a particular group of people that they'd like to keep a little bit segmented. So we'd like to go over some of those basic permissions in that space if you feel the need to create it. Creating more shared drives does create a bit more noise, a bit more clutter. Yes, yeah. So just you know, be um, think carefully about why you would create a space uh, for that. And we kind of want to avoid too many shared drives. Now, it's important that if you're creating a shared drive that has a reach within your school, you should always have the principal in there as a manager. They should have a, uh, they should have their toe in every every space, I think. Absolutely. And that also covers you. If you, the, you and one other are the only manager of the space, and for whatever reason you leave the department, um, that content will be inaccessible to anybody else. You're right, you should have for the school. Yeah. So, I mean... Built within the files and arrangement time migration space, you've obviously got your kind of an executive level kind of folder that represents yep. that old space. So a really good space to store that higher level content. You've got that office space, which has often got some of that um, relevant content stored. Principals have their own space, which is just around that principal space. So if there's anything outside of those that you think you need, it might be a maybe a, an upper exec or a sub exec level where you yeah. want to have just the principal and then maybe two DPs. You might create one for EV maybe. Yeah, yeah, it could be an EV. So basically to do that, not too hard. You simply click on the shared drives on the left-hand side, make sure you're viewing them all. And then when you click new, it's just asking you to, to pop in a new shared drive. So you can name that. Uh, that might be, yeah, a group, a group task, something that's quite big. I probably wouldn't do it for every athletics carnival, every cross country, oh, no. every Easter hat yeah. parade. I wouldn't do it for all of those things because as Jared said, the more you make, the messier it gets and the harder it gets to keep track of where does everything live. There should be folders within your teacher structure that accounts for all of those. Yeah. Every... Uh, annual events, I guess we can call them. Yeah, yeah, things that affect everyone. It's always better to keep it all in that teacher space. And in our next session, we'll really delve into uh, a file structure. But let's say for whatever reason you feel your school needs one. Yeah, so we've got uh, our shared drive. Uh, we've obviously named it. When we click create, it automatically launched it into here. There's no content in here, obviously. To manage our members, we just click on manage members, nice and easy. And then it's prompting us to add some people groups. Now, there are some really nice dynamic groups within uh, Google that's connected to the uh, Active Directory or the, I guess the grouping systems behind department, um, department uh, grades, teachers and schools. So typing in a school code, for example, 
and this works for all schools. Uh, you can type in your school code followed by the word teacher or staff or grade or year. Even uh, you could get down to a class absolutely. name. It all depends on how it was entered in the earning system. Yeah, so it's pulling on all of, I guess, the existing groups within the Department of Education. So you can see I can, I can share this shared drive with all non-teachers of this particular school or all teachers of the school. And I guess that connection there is also live. So as teachers come in and out of that active directory group, brand new teacher starts at the school, they've uh, locked into payroll, they're part of the school, they automatically get their birthright as a teacher, they drop into this group automatically. So I don't need to uh, continually monitor that group. If I know I've shared it with all teachers, that's done. Uh, and I don't think I'll notify everyone. Uh, and you choose what level they get as well. So let's talk about those levels. Yeah, I guess five, there's five main levels. Important to know about the different levels. Three are probably most relevant, I guess. Yeah. Um, so content manager, I guess, is a not quite the top level, but yeah. mostly what everyone needs. And that's why it's the default. So it's yes. enough that you can uh, you can see what it does there, actually. It adds, edit, move, delete, and share content. So yeah. it kind of gives you just enough to be able to do everything you want to do. What you can't do is actually manage people and settings. So content manager is enough to use the drive as a storage location, add and remove content, edit whatever you need, yeah. but you don't have that kind of higher level access of adding new people to the drive or modifying who's a member of the yeah. drive, that kind of higher level. All, all the settings and how it works. It's, yeah. it's only a small jump, yeah. but it's an important jump that not everyone's a manager. But let's say this was a, a space where you might have had all the exec, all the sub, you know, I guess exec is all sub exec, but maybe you might have, Maybe you've got some exec teachers that aren't on exec payroll sort of thing. They may be doing um, acting roles, acting or, roles, or, or something roles. of that nature. Yeah. Maybe just being they're involved in this process. You may uh, add them all into a shared space, but you should have always have at least two managers. Definitely, minimum two managers for any space, just as a contingency. Yeah, definitely. Or you might choose to to make people contribute. So you actually want people to be able to put content in, but not necessarily edit anything that's. Uh, well, you can't. Can sorry, edit you, uh, not be able to remove anything that's in there and those yeah, sort of things. Yeah. At the very bottom level, if you, if you are in commenter, basically you can see what's in there, but you can't do anything with that to, to a degree. So uh, that those viewer and commenter options could be useful if you might have a shared drive set up maybe for students. Yeah. You might put content on in there that they can access and look at. Yeah, all sorts of different options there. So it's good to know what's there, good to know what you can do. Uh, and these uh, active directory groups, we might even have a look if we're going to share that with a 9068 and put the word year in there or, or class. Was it year? Oops. Oh, an extra number in there. Oh, got a, oh, six, eight. This is just the 96. That's our test space. Yep. And maybe we, I think there's one here called year. There's all yeah. the old students in YouTube. So as long as it's kind of pulling from the right content in uh, EMU or EARN, uh, yeah. then it's going to grab those classes that you got. Really good for primary schools. They're still working on that connection for high schools. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe when uh, in the future they'll have some really great connections with high schools as well, pulling on high school timetables, which I know are a complex state in themselves. But normally within primary schools, you've got those set classes for the year and it can pull on that information. So really exactly. useful to, to be able to manage those shared drives. So yeah, if you ever create a shared drive, there's some just some important um, things to think about. And I guess before, as we finish the session, we might just have a little chat about um, having a look at analysing your current file organisation. Like I've seen a lot of teacher faculty drives or teacher Google drives like this, and they are not a very well organised space. They are usually organised chaos because everyone starts creating folders willy nilly. So probably at this point, having a look at, there could be some elements of there that are working great for your school. What things should we keep moving forward? Because reorganising this space uh, really comes down to time and capacity when you have the ability to do it. Yeah. Probably not the most fun job in the world, but the efficiency and productivity boosts, amazing. Mm. Um, so having a look, what's there? What works? What doesn't work? What are the pain points? And I probably, what do you think? I would probably like to do that as a, uh, a discussion during uh, maybe a whole school staff meeting. Yep. Maybe have a few key people that will put together something to take to everyone um, moving forward. And like we mentioned before, no, no, don't organ like when you organise your new sort of structure, you don't want to go any more than four deep. Are you any more than four deep currently in teacher? Uh, five at the most, but it just becomes too much of a rabbit maze to find everything. Absolutely. And having to think about that, well, as we talked talk, talked about before, thinking about an archive space, how can you use that archive space? Um, so people, yeah, what needs to be archived? What needs to be deleted sometimes? I think there's a lot of content in there that's just old legacy kind of content that doesn't need to be there anymore. Of course, we want to hang on to our historical data from a school, whether yep. it's images from school, you know, events gone past, like and yep. all sorts of stuff. There's definitely a place for that to be kept, um, but we want to make sure that, that, that all the relevant content is there. So thinking about, I guess, 
top level folders. So I guess we can call them top, top tier priority. folders. Yeah. What needs to be at the top? Who can create a new folder in this space? Um, the, basically, the, I guess this is a really horrible example in here. If I actually jump into the Explorer here and I go into my Google Drive, into Shared Drives and into Teacher, let's have a look. Really horrible example here because we've got all these files and folders that just have nowhere to live. They're at the yeah. very top of the folder structure. They shouldn't be there, basically. They should have be in one of these folders or a subfolder. If there's no place for them yet, then there needs to be discussion about where that folder should be. I feel um, at this top level, there should be very few, if, if at any, files. At that very top level, everything should be in a folder. Yep. It needs to be searchable um, over time. And I guess once you get into that kind of like whole school space, uh, then we're thinking about things about like policies and procedures want to live somewhere. Medical information is really important. You might have a tech support page. These are just I guess, some examples. And we'll go a little bit deeper into how that could look. I guess at this stage, yeah. it's just about starting the discussion. Um, as Jared said, nobody really wants to do it. So sometimes nobody brings it up because yeah. if you bring it up, they're going to go, great idea, it. you do it. No. But um, I think maybe bring it up with the, look, I don't want to do it by myself, but I think it's worth yeah. doing because um, it does cause frustration mm -hmm. and pain, time, when you've got a messy structure to try and find that content. And what we've spoken to so many schools that have gone through this and it's taken a bit of time to get it sorted, but they cannot speak any more highly of having a good organised file structure. Just for anyone coming in, casuals, um, just anyone trying to find anything when you change grades, you don't have to familiarise yourself with the new whole the way that grade has done it, just that uniformity is the key. So who's going to do it? When can you do it? What are the key things we need to keep and what do we need to get rid of? And when, when that get rid of, 80% of what used to sit in fac the old faculty drive hadn't been touched in more than two years and there's tons of duplication. Yeah. So there's probably a whole bunch that, look, if you're not sure, should I delete it? Let's just archive it. Let's put it somewhere so we don't have to scroll past heaps of content to get to this year's. So there's just a few things, I think, um, to think about. Hopefully, if you're watching this as a webinar, please throw any of your uh, comments in the chat yep. um, to be answered. Um, but yeah, hopefully you got something out of those those steps. Now we might quickly just throw back to our um, presentation. If you have any, uh, if you need any further support in this area, I would uh, flick an email to the school's digital strategy uh, inbox, and someone from our team can try and work with your school to improve um, or help you in any way. Um, uh, otherwise, you could also try the T for All Innovations email address there for further support. Yep, absolutely. So hopefully, um, yeah, you found that useful. Again, digging a little bit deeper, diving into some student-facing content, looking at Google Classroom, how you're using it, and then uh, a bit of bit of a touch on some of those security aspects. Yes. Sharing is really great. But we want to make sure we know who we're sharing with, when we're sharing, and how much we're sharing. Yes. Really important. When to share and when to share drive. <laughs> yeah. I guess use a shared drive over sharing. We don't want to overcomplicate that kind of uh, situation. And then also thinking about that file structure that can really improve, as Jared said, it can really improve workflows when everyone knows where everything is yes. uh, and it's you know, you're not uh, saving things in a bit of a haphazard way. And in the next uh, video the, the, uh, in this series, we look at actually defining what is some examples, defining that structure, getting everything organized, consolidating your data from multiple sources. And um, yeah, setting some good digital procedures to start to grow in this space. Up until this point, this is just getting your head around using it effectively. And don't forget, we want to make sure that everyone in your school feels confident to be able to use uh, their files and operate in this uh, cloud environment. Perfect. Well, thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll see you in the next video. Thanks, guys.